the theme of this evening, and, uh, and thank you for all coming. This is something the council is anxious to keep going. It's, um, it's our member outreach. Or it's, the council wants to reach out to the members. Um, in the past, I think there's been some conversation about we don't know our council members and they're, they're a little distant from us. So this is one of the ways um, that we really want to reach out and, and have you. So I think we'll, we'll be doing a whole series of these, hopefully every few months. We'll, we'll have these, um, in addition to, we're always accessible um, and, uh, and available, and certainly we have our monthly council meetings. A couple other things. There's, um, there's some material on some of your tables about the senior discount. There wasn't enough copies to go around. Uh, it is on our website. Um, if, you want a, uh, if you want a copy, you can just contact uh, info at, at Pounder Mountain Co-op and Stephanie will get you a copy. Um, that's not for, per se, for a conversation tonight. Um, though you certainly ask questions later. So, and after this session, we'll, um, we've got a few council members here, and Kari obviously is here, and we'll uh, ask the council and general manager any questions that, uh, that you all have. The real goal that we're gonna to have tonight is, you guys are the members, and we're up to 9,000 members. The vision, where do we want this co-op to go? Um, from detail, from a, from a philosophical and a 30,000 view, 30,000 foot view, or, or things that are very, very specific. Um, that's what we'd like to accomplish tonight. This is just the beginning of, of many conversations. Uh, over a three to, three to five year plan, um, where where do you envision and where would you like to see this co-op um, grow or not grow or, or what what would be your vision? <clears throat> um, so here's the agenda. The um, shopper surveys. We've, we we've got many many outreach things. Um, a couple things that are not on here. We've had uh, Kari and I have had a couple of uh, sessions. Have coffee with the president. I'm actually the president. Scott has some the president co-op. Um, we had coffee with the, with the uh, general manager and president, and we had kombucha with the co-op and president. So we're, we're really trying to um, get in tune and, and understand where you would like to see your co-op come from a, from a ground level or, or from high above. Uh, we're going to have, we'll have this discussion, and Carter will give you some, some information. We'll have uh, each table give us your, some of your very brief thoughts on where you would like to see this the vision of the co-op that you uh, that you foresee, and then it, hopefully around 7.15 or so for maybe 45 minutes or so if you guys have questions, we'd love you to stick around and uh, and have a little dialogue or ask, us some, ask the council some questions. And I think we've got uh, three or so, Patrice is here, Steve with the council members, Jose, okay, and Carl, thank you. So we've got, and, and, and Eric, so we've got a nice, Representation and Lydia's here. She's our staff rep, so she's also on the council. So, thank you very much, and I'll give it away. Thank you, Scott. <clears throat> Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, we've been doing these dinner and discussions here at the senior center, I think, for five years, and this is um, twice as many people as ever ever gotten to come to these. So, uh, thanks. I don't know what it was. Um, good organic romaine lettuce or something, but uh, <laughs> thank you for coming. And there's still plenty of food. <laughs> and there's a lot more food. All right, so we're going to just jump right in, and uh, I'm going to give you just a few slides about the results from our last shopper survey. We do this um, once a year in the in the uh, winter, and uh, we asked this year we asked some questions about demographics to get a sense of the where the membership is, um, satisfaction, and just different preferences that you have. This year we had 1,452 responses, up a fair amount from last year. And just the caveat that this is not a scientific uh, study. Um, it's not, we don't have representative samples you're selecting if you want to take this, the, um, um, the uh, survey. But um, we did have the equivalent of 14% of our owners take the, take the survey. So that, um, it's, we're getting some good information from this. Um, just a couple statistics, 44% of respondents said that they do at least half of their shopping at the co-op, and that's actually down um, from 2012. And then 44% also have been shopping at the co-op for 16 or more years. We asked um, the question, how far do you travel to, to come to the co-op? 
Um, and it's basically third, third, third in our different categories. We have uh, um, zero to three miles right here in Montpelier proper is, is a third. And then three to 12 miles is 32% and more than 12 miles is 35%. And what's interesting about this is when we asked this in 2010, it was almost the same breakdown. And I would have guessed that um, by 2018, people have more options available and have less need to drive more than 12 miles to do their grocery shopping. But that apparently that is not the case. We're still getting um, about the same. And we also asked, do you commute to Montpelier for work? Um, and only 20% of the respondents said they do. Uh, we asked uh, people to put themselves in age classes. And you can see in the comparison of 2014 to 2018, or if you can't see, basically what they're showing us is we are getting older as a group, we knew that. Um, but one of the things that's striking about this is that almost half of the membership is between, or you know, of the respondents, I should say, is between the ages of 55 and 74. So just about 50% in, in that 20 year span. And what's interesting there is almost half of those are above 65 and half of those are below 65. Uh, here's household income distribution. You can see a nice normal distribution with a peak in the fifty to seventy-five thousand dollar a year um, range. Uh, this is not a normal distribution. This is uh, this shows uh, the rates of education amongst uh, respondents, and uh, this this is interesting in that um, almost eighty percent of respondents had a four-year degree or, or higher in terms of education. Okay, so that was demographics, now moving on to satisfaction. We asked a series of questions with a five-point scale of, you know, how, to what degree are we meeting your needs? Uh, five is very well, one is very um, poorly, I think. And um, for the overall categories, overall store, overall products, overall surface, service, you see that we rated fairly high, 4.3 or 4.4, and between 86 and 89 percent of respondents said that they were meeting their needs either well or very well. So good scores there. This is just going a little bit deeper on the service questions. You, you probably can't see this very well, uh, but the, the highest scores were knowledgeable staff and product returns, very high scores in that area. The lowest in this set of uh, question was for telephone and for website, uh, but both have improved over the, over the past uh, eight years. Um, and then the highest overall rating was for availability of natural and organic products. Almost everybody agreed that we do that pretty well. Lowest rating, as per usual, was prices. Um, and then the biggest changes from 2010, we got a nice uptick in responsiveness to feedback. Um, and then um, a decrease in the average score for satisfaction with checkouts and registers. And then these are questions that are not about the shopping experience, but more about the values of the co-op. And you can see that the average score range between 4.0 for the is the co-op a valued source of information about food and health issues, up to 4.45 for co-op supports the local food economy. So generally pretty good scores here, again on a one to five scale. And then this is the, um, the, the bottom line question, how likely are you to recommend the co-op to a friend or colleague? 89% said likely or highly, highly likely. Okay. And then just a few other questions just to round this out. We asked people, get a lot of concerns about parking and parking limiting, especially around lunchtime. Um, so we asked, what, to what extent does parking limit your access to the co-op? And 54% said never, 5% said frequently. And we've also been giving some thought to e-commerce and online ordering, specifically with the option of ordering online and picking up in store, something that's become um, somewhat popular in the grocery world. And um, people, about 12% of people said they were very interested, and 52% said they're not at all. And then this is a word cloud. We ask people, uh, what, who do you think um, should be a recipient of our Give Change program? So if you've been asked if you want to round up at the registers um, for one of our local uh, community partners, 
Um, these were ideas. They're not necessarily, the words are not necessarily associated with each, with each other, but food and bank, you can see, are, are together. Um, but basically, the size of the word corresponds with how frequently we got that response. So you see a lot of interest in food shelf, food pantry, food bank. And one more, we asked about our prepared foods department at Delhi. It's been growing quite rapidly. A lot of interest in that department. We asked, what are the products that you really like in our deli? We would have some sense of that because we, we make that food. Uh, and we asked, what else would you like? And this, this was the word cloud for what do you like. And uh, a lot of interest in sandwiches and soups and salad. I thought it was really interested that both dolmas and grape leaves showed up on this. Vegan BLT and roasted soup. <laughs> Vegan BLT, yeah. So, interesting. Okay, so just going to pause there. Any questions about the survey before we move on to the next step? Peter. This isn't a question. I just wanted you to repeat. This is the results of the people who filled out the survey. Right. It's not not uh, not necessarily representative. It's the people that filled it out. Okay. <laughs> One of the reasons that we do the survey each year is to prepare ourselves for business planning. We're on a fiscal year that starts in July. So right now, we're putting together the business plan for next year. And it's nice to, to take the temperature of the membership, um, ask specific questions about online ordering or whatever is of interest, and then use that as a foundation for business planning. So now I'm going to shift to talking about, um, about the, our planning. And, um, and we'll end up with you giving some, some of your ideas. Um, so I'm going to refer us to our mission, because the business plan and everything we do is in service to this mission. So. Hunger Mountain Cooperative exists to create and sustain a vibrant community of healthy individuals, sustainable local food systems, and thriving cooperative commerce. So that's what we're all about. We think a lot about those words, and we have ways to interpret and measure them, and you're going to see some of that coming up. Um, so here's a few trends to, to, to give you some more information about where the co-op is at, where we, where our trajectory. So uh, membership trends, we've had uh, strong growth in the number of co-op member owners over the past decade. Um, it's, it's almost doubled in the past 10 years. Uh, and it's been growing about 6 7% or more each year, um, and faster than the rate of sales growth, which is interesting. And I'm happy to say that last week, we surpassed 9,000 member owners. So good milestone for us in our small community of something uh, like um, this is a very different trend line. This is sales growth. Now, this does re represent growth, growth of sales over the previous year. So everything is above zero, which means we've been continuing to grow. But you can see that the rate of change, the rate of growth, has been declining pretty steadily for the past uh, eight years. Uh, and um, happy to see that um, we, we have a nice rebound this year, year to date, um, because last year we were pretty close to zero. Is that um, sales growth um, number a dollar? No, it's, it's a percentage. Food? If you can't see, is, is it food item? Is it items? All products, all sales, sales of all products. All, that's, that's the number of dollars over, dollars this year over dollars last year. Dollars sold. Yeah. As opposed, as opposed to volume. Yeah, volume. Is, yeah. There, is there a volume? We do track that, and I have some information about that. Um, I, I don't know if it's going to be as specific as you, you'd like to see, but I can get volume. Because I mean, sales can be whatever the price happens to right. be charged. So, sa sales are a, are a function of how many transactions and what is the average size. And the average size of the transaction includes things like price. And prices fluctuate. And, but. Um, and then the volume of, of products is important as well. Normally. All right, I, I've, I've heard that this pattern is occurring throughout the country. It is, and I've got some slides on that as well. So hold that thought. This is not unique to us. Um, and just a little bit of detail about what's going on this year. We're seeing very strong growth in supplements. If you haven't heard of CBD oil, that is the uh, leading category right now. Um, prepared foods uh, continues its steady increase. Um, there's just more and more interest in the convenience and uh, having a healthy prepared foods option. And we've benefited from that. Also nice to see um, strong growth in produce. 
know, we have a large local component, obviously fresh and healthy food. On the negative side, we've seen decline in cheese, wine, bakery, and beer should be in there too, I don't know why. We'll fix that. <laughs> Working on that? Thank you. Um, yeah, good question. Um, if this were any other year, you would see bulk in the negative category. Bulk has had three years of sales decline, also not unique to Hunger Mountain. As prepared foods seems to go up, bulk has been declining, but we've actually seen some improvement this year, for whatever reason, hard to tell why. So correlated with overall sales is the sales of local products. We define local as grown or value added within Vermont and or 100 miles of Montclair. And so that includes um, food and non-food products. It also includes foods that we make in our prepared foods department. Uh, and you can see that we've had nice growth over the past five years, except between 2016 and 2017, uh, when we only grew a little bit overall, local product sales only grew a little bit overall. Uh, and, but, but about 40% of store sales come from local, and we do business with 502 Vermont vendors. A lot of relationships. Uh, we also are concerned with sustainability. One of the things that we measure is electric electricity usage, and we've seen a nice decline over time of that, and uh, for the first time this year, we're generating renewable electricity, which is approximately 2% of our needs, pretty modest. Um, so some social measures. This shows the number of donations and sponsorships where we're giving back to the community. Uh, in various ways, and you can see that this number has improved, improved quite a bit over time. One of the big factors in 2017 is the Bag That Bag program. So now when you're uh, bringing in your reusable bag, rather than receive a five cent credit for yourself, those nickels are being pooled. And last year we sent a fat $11,000 a month. Did you have a... That was the question. Yeah, yeah, so that was the lion's share of the increase, but other things as well. And um, just an interesting tidbit, we have a lot of food that is unsaleable. Um, most of it is, is um, either bread that's left over um, from a, you know, day old bread or in some cases produce um, that, that's not going to sell. And virtually all of that product um, is, um, goes to human use and um, Capstone Community Action um, estimates they picked up over 27,000 pounds last year. Wow. Um, and then if you remember in the mission, thriving cooperative community, what does that mean? Well, one of the things it means is that we support our fellow co-ops, and one of the ways that we do that is we invest in co-ops. We are a member of other cooperatives. We are a member of cooperative associations, and we from time to time will uh, loan other co-ops uh, money for when they're doing projects, expansions, and things like that. Um, and you can see that over time, we've built up the amount that we're investing in co-ops. These are investments. We do expect to get a rate of return on these, um, but it's a way to use our assets in a, in a, in a way that supports the mission. Um, we also sell products from other co-ops, and we measured that for the first time this last year, and I was surprised that uh, almost 5% of our, our store sales come from co-ops, products from other co-ops. Does that include Cabot? Yes. And Organic Valley and Big Mom Small. Co op ish. Okay, another, another conversation. Uh, and then a, a few bullets on employees. Uh, where are we at with employees? Uh, it's um, probably many of you are aware that it's, it's been a challenging year in terms of employee relations. And so here's a snapshot. We have about 164 employees. You may know that uh, we put a high value on employee compensation and allocate quite a bit of our resources towards compensation. So when we talk about price, we also have to talk about employee compensation and vendor compensation. Um, but uh, for example, all of our employees are at least the Vermont livable wage and we have an excellent benefit package. However, there has been a fair amount of dissatisfaction that's been voiced over the past year. Um, one of the ways that was, ex was expressed, and we had um, union contract negotiations, which were um, very lengthy last year. They took uh, an extra uh, two, three months longer than, than we would normally see. Um, and so we did finally resolve that, and um, 
hope to, to do better in, in future negotiations. Kari? Yeah. I, I noticed you have 22 grievances uh, filed. Uh, could, do you know what the resolve were of those 22? I do. I don't have the data right now. It's a mix of uh, these are, uh, grievances are when the employee union files a formal grievance saying that they don't agree with a decision or a policy or an action. Um, so the results of those are, are mixed. The, some of them um, were agreed, we agreed to a remedy that maybe they proposed, maybe we proposed, maybe we uh, negotiated. Uh, in some cases, we declined their remedy, didn't find that the, the grievance had warrant. Um, so it's a real range. Yeah. How many of those are still outstanding? Um, none of those. Those are all resolved. Those are all resolved. It's, um, uh, we do have new grievances that are impossible. It's, it's declined. Uh, um, 22 is by far and away the largest number we've ever seen. Um, and this year we're on track for far fewer. But. How many coming out of there that haven't been put down? I'm not sure. Um, maybe three? I, would, I wouldn't necessarily know about all of them. If the okay. union's planning on filing grievance, I wouldn't know. The question was how many grievance are in process right now that are not resolved? I'm saying okay. maybe three. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure. How many terminations? Um, okay, so at the bottom of this, let me just get through the next two bullets. Um, another challenge that we have had, oh, I was going to mention staff satisfaction survey. This year, because of the uh, dissatisfaction that was vocalized, uh, we made, um, the council made the decision to have a third party do the staff satisfaction survey. So normally this time of year I would have some data share, share with you on that, but um, that uh, consultant is still working through the process of uh, compiling the results of the staff satisfaction survey. Another area where we've had challenges is safety. Last year we had 37 workers' comp claims, compensation claims, which is a high number. We've been over 30 the last three years. Uh, it's an area where we struggled um, to improve. Uh, we have good years and bad years, um, but it, uh, it, it's an ongoing challenge. I feel, I feel that we, we have a good program. We definitely talk about safety. We have good um, measures in place, but there's still something missing that we're not quite getting there. So we can keep trying, which includes the efforts of our safety committee. Sorry. Yes? With the staff satisfaction survey, um, I sat in on, the, on one of the council meetings and one, on the question um, relative to staff having trust in management, the numbers went really low. And I'm wondering what you might plan to do to bring those numbers up. Yeah, um, so maybe I can answer that when we get to what we're planning for next year. Sorry. Is there a pattern to, in the, uh, to the nature of the safety claims? It's a lot of repetitive motion, a lot of um, overuse kinds of injuries, especially in arms, so shoulder, elbow, wrist. So if you think about the, the actions that a cashier or a clerk do over and over and over again, a lot of them result from that. So er ergonomics, we spend, spend a lot of focus on what are the right equipment and dynamics and training to, to, to do those jobs. In the hospital, we have mandatory in-service about things like that. Do you have? Uh, we do. We have we have uh, mandatory training. Um, so on, on a little more positive side, um, over the past year, the staff has formed a green team, which is focused on environmental issues. And doing a lot of good work with um, recycling programs and recycling more than just the standard things that you can put in our mixed mixed use recycling. Um, and as a retail store, we have a lot of that kind of material, plastics, those sorts of things. And then over this past year, we've started um, uh, a new organizational development effort um, uh, in an area called appreciative inquiry. And we don't have really time to get into the details, but it's another way of thinking about the cooperative and, and what we do. And the appreciative part is really focusing on, on what do we value in the co-op? What, what do we feel are the the things that are the most powerful and how can we develop those further. And so um, out of that work, we have four initiatives that the staff is really staff driven. And I'll talk about those in a little bit more. And then the last um, 
uh, item is turnover. We have extremely low employee turnover um, in the retail world. Last year it was 16%, it's been below 20% for about five years. And the average tenure is, is uh, right now nine years. So a lot of folks that have been with us for quite a long time and maybe related, related to some of that overuse injury um, that we've been having. Yeah. Exit interviews. For yeah. the, uh, what, what would be the most uh, reason for the people leaving? I, that's a good question. I don't have the answer to that. No. Uh, I, I'm not sure. Uh, so, so just for point of reference, the grocery industry, 60% is the normal, and we have pure costs where 100% is, is common. So shifting into external trends, people are well aware that the state has record low unemployment right now. It's a very tight labor market, and um, we are hearing reports from co-ops that are, aren't able to um, hire the staff that they need, especially in, in, in terms of food service. Um, so our low turnover, I think, is, is interesting in that context. Um, also, an external trend that's not new this year, but we've seen pretty consistent um, high growth of natural, organic, and local foods. And this is, this is across the country. Um, some people are describing uh, it as a wellness economy. People are increasingly interested in health and wellness of themselves and their families. Food is an integral part of that. And so people are drawn to, to natural foods. And this has led to a lot of competition and, um, and, and in turn consolidation in the industry. And the, the most notable over the past year was Whole Foods and Amazon. Um, there's also a lot of in innovation that's happening around the world, especially in, uh, online. Okay. Um, Michael, you asked about price. This is an interesting piece. Um, this shows the consumer price index for food at home, which is the products we sell, over the past 40 years. And you can see that basically what this is showing is inflation in, in um, grocery prices from 1970 on, but it appears that that has started to level out. Um, the reason that's interesting is that um, uh, you know, for years, grocery grocers had a built-in um, sales growth, as you were pointing out. Um, because expenses are always growing, it's nice to have your sales always growing to, to try to match that. And if that's changing now, um, or if you go into a deflation mode, then that can be trouble. What does this mean? What are the numbers on the left hand? It's an index. I, I can't really. Well, I mean, this is a reflection of price or volume or percentage of all the income. What's yeah, there's a basket of goods that USDA um, uh, employees will shop in different parts of the country. They'll put it together, and from that, they compare it to an index and show how prices have been changing for all different kinds of categories of food. How does that compare to the CPI in general? Good question. I, I, I can't tell you. <laughs> but also that says all this, all urban. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So this is not limited to the Northeast. Um, so here's some data about co-ops across the country. If we share data, we know this. But the average co-op um, saw a nice growth between the period of 2000 and 2008 when the Great Recession hit, and uh, things have been fairly flat or even negative on average since Sorry. then. Are those numbers for the NCG co-ops? Or... Yes, okay. these are NCG, yeah. NCG data. Yeah. Um, and coupled with that, there is increasing pressure. As I said, competition has led to downward pressure on gross margin. Gross margin is related to price. It's, it's what's left or over after you pay for the cost of goods. And as there's more price competition, that means margins come down. At the same time, personnel costs have been coming up, maybe in part because of the tight labor market, uh, things like the movement for $15 an hour um, wages. Um, and all that's brought earnings down. And we've seen six NCG co-ops close in the past two years. And there are 12 that are currently Sorry, could I, I'd like to address that if I could. Um, 
it seems I've, I've been looking into the NCG, the relationship they have with the NCG in the last year, and it seems like we're pretty well hooked into them, for better or worse. But with the um, consolidation of Amazon and Whole Foods, I've heard it said that any co-op that's in that orbit of a Whole Foods is going to be one of those co-ops that's struggling and that those co-ops can expect to, or rather those numbers can increase. So my question is, um, just regards the wisdom of being hooked into NCG if it, if it faces this problem of struggling co-ops. Yeah, because I'm not quite following the question since the, the, you're saying that there's enhanced competition from Whole Foods now being under, a, yeah. a, a, having much deeper pockets. So I, I would think that co-ops working together with a national association is only going to be helpful. I mean, there are criticisms of NCG. I, I think highly of the organization, but I, I, you know, we should be open about where it could be stronger. But at the end of the day, it's going to, in general, benefit the co-ops that are members of it. Can you want to just explain what NCG is? So NCG is National Cooperative Grocers. It's a secondary co-op, so it's a co-op that's owned by food co-ops like us. There are 150 members across the country, and so we have a vote on the board of directors and, and other things. And one of the main things that they do is negotiate um, purchasing contracts for us. So our everybody's everybody in the natural foods world essentially is using um, United Natural Foods as its main distributor, and so we're we're. <coughs> Um, we're, we're achieving much better pricing as a result of banding together with 150. Harry, I have a question about that. Yep. Um, I understand, as you said, we're a member of NCG, and we pay them something to be a member. And we have a contract with NCG. You have a member agreement. A member agreement. And I've asked for a copy of it, and you've told me I can't see it. It's confidential. And I would just wanted to say I find that really disturbing partly because the Rochdale principles, which have been incorporated by the council, say that any relationship with an outside organization has to be, I don't remember the exact language, basically it has to be disclosed. You, you're, you have a contract, this co-op has a contract with another organization, and I as a member don't have privy to what it says or what kind of commitments this co-op may be making. I find it, I find it very disturbing and I, I don't know what else to say, that you've said it's confidential, and you said there may be proprietary information in it. There, well, there is. That's and true. that could certainly could be redacted. That, that could be redacted, which is a common practice, and then whatever isn't, but would be of interest to the members, um, I think really needs to be disclosed. So that concern has been noted. The, the reason it hasn't been shared is, in fact, it includes information about our contracts with other entities like United Natural Foods, and we don't have permission to share that with consumer members. The, the council is your representatives, and, and managers have seen the contract and are executing it on your behalf. I understand the concern, and you'd like, you'd like to see it, and <coughs> there is in the works an update to the member agreements that will be a, you know, an appropriate version you know, to share with you. You're saying that you're going to be revising? Or I'm not me, but NCG is in the process of doing it. I think I shared this information with you that it's planned for the fall of this year. And then we'll be able to see it. Exactly. Okay. Still, it's very disturbing. I mean, remember, we own this co-op. And to, for the co-op to, to make an agreement with another organization that we can't know what it says, it's just very disturbing. And I can only say it over and over again. And I think it violates our bylaws. And it violates the... Um, governance policies, where books are supposed to be open, where membership is supposed to be privy to, to whatever everything. is going on. Everything? Yeah, I think, I think we disagree. No, I, I disagree. You can't look at the social security numbers of the employees. You, you, I mean, there are just some things in businesses. You enter into agreements. It's complicated. We're a multi-million. Well, Michael, business. I think there's a huge difference between personal personal social security numbers and an agreement between this co-op of which we are the owners and another organization. And go read, go read the uh, Rochdale principles. Go read the bylaws. Go read the government's I I policies. Was the, I was on the co-op council. I think you should run to the council. I was on the council for okay. seven years, Michael. Okay. I mean. 
All I'm saying is that there's a vast difference. I don't think that's a very good analogy. Well, I, I think of a better one. I, 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 okay, I, I, point, point well taken, and I want to keep moving, but you have just, just if you could give us um, a, a, a one or two, for instances, of what is involved that, that needs to be kept confidential. I'm not quite sure I... The, like, like pricing, like con, you know, the, the, some of the specifics of our purchasing contract with United Natural Foods and other entities with the a contract. I mean, it's not the best way to write these member agreements, and that's recognized that a lot of that information doesn't have, that specific information does not have to be in the document that Stephanie's requested to see. Does that, does that make sense? Not really. <laughs> so, so Kari, is, 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 trying to get a sense. is the overall concern that maybe Whole Foods or Amazon might get hold of our numbers and then use that to undermine NCG and well, not not is that well. Uh, I, I, I suppose that I, I suppose wondering. that is the concern. If 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 our competitors get wind of our agreements with their suppliers, they're going to they're going to use that information. Right. Well, I think you know just life is speculation. Right. I mean, you know, there's a lot of things that if, if it can be redacted, if significant areas of this agreement, which I didn't know about, can be redacted, um, where, there, where, where there's not the concerns that the you have and other people have, um, I would think that that would be a, a, a fairly viable option. To explore. I mean, I, I, do, I consider it to be in process. I mean, we'll have something for you this year. You had a point. So, on another note, on personnel costs, do you um, have any information about how many full-time and versus part-time jobs and how at, at our has it gone in the direction of less full-time jobs available and, and more people? It's, we're, somewhere, we're somewhere around 110, 120 full-time and then the 40 to 50 some odd are part-time or sub. and a lot of subs that don't have actual regular hours. But the amount and, of and over time, I'm not sure. I mean, uh, uh, I don't have the data, but in general, I think that number has been going up. We have a commitment in our union contract that says we will try to provide full time. But the amount of full time jobs has not gone down. It's not gone down, no. Okay. I'm going to keep moving here. Um, just to just point this out is uh, the, the general manager turnover rate um, has been um, increasing over time. It did go down this last year, but this is the number of turnovers at 150 co-ops. Um, and I think this is an indication of a couple things. One is that the job has just gotten harder over time, um, you know, whether it's competition or discord within co-ops. It's not as easy as it used to be. Uh, and the other thing is that this is not just GMs. I think this is illustrative of other positions at, at co-ops as well. Maybe even board members. Uh, so just a little bit of um, business theory, just to, um, the council's seen this before, but I think this is worth thinking about. Uh, there is a theory that business and industries go through cycles. And as there's a startup, a new idea is introduced, it's a sort of slow rate of growth until there's an efficiency that's gained and it hits the mass market and then there's more rapid growth and then there's a flood of competitors enter in, and pretty, pretty soon market share is hard to come by, and, and growth, the rate of growth is slowed, and then eventually you'll end up in decline um, if you don't figure out what's next and how to, how to, how to sort of innovate and keep, keep the upward cycle going. And um, the big, one of the big points of discussion in the food co-op world is, is this us? Is this introductory period, um, you know, the 60s and 70s when co-ops were the only game in town when it came to natural foods? And then we all experienced this rapid rate of growth in the 80s and 90s and to the 2000s. And we're definitely seeing slowing um, sales overall. And so what, what's next? And this is, this is probably the most interesting slide, I think. What this shows is the lines are the number of food co-ops in this country the shaded area is the volume of sales associated with that. But if you just look at the lines, basically it shows that there are three waves of food co-ops. The first one goes back to the 30s. Those are the co-ops that started in the Depression era, where access to food period was, was the issue. 
And uh, at one point there were, what, what six, six, 600 plus of those food co-ops, and there's just a handful of them left now. We happen to have a few in our area. Uh, Adamant, Putney, Hanover, are part of the old wave co-ops. Um, then there's the, the new wave, which was in the 60s and 70s, where natural foods was the purpose of those co-ops. And at one point there were 700 of those, and we're, you know, we're down to a couple hundred or something like that. And so um, went through a boom and bust cycle. And now we're, in, we're actually in a third wave. If you haven't heard of this, there are new co-ops that are being formed. Uh, the, one of the newest one is the Morrisville Food Co-op. And um, a lot of those co-ops uh, do carry natural foods, but they have a big focus on local foods. That seems to be one of the big drivers. And then they're often located in areas where there isn't enough food available. Retail food available. So, if you think about the Berry uh, Grand City Grocery, one of the main impetuses of that store is to have a downtown co op. So, so um, this just illustrates, I think, that what's happening today isn't necessarily what's going to be happening tomorrow. What would the pink, green, and what is That's the, the volume of sales associated with those numbers of co ops. So, you can see the same thing up and down. So and this just shows that it's not all doom and gloom. There are, in 2017, there were a number of co-ops that did major growth projects, and five of them were in the Northeast, including Onion River Co-op in Burlington and Middlebury Co-op, and Littleton Co-op. Uh, and this, this um, shows one of the ways that co-ops can be successful, I think, is focusing on mul um, multiple values, not just financial benefit, but also things like supporting local um, and giving back to the community and ethnic diversity. Um, so um, NCG co-ops have set goals, um, uh, impact goals, to, uh, to, to do better in certain meeting our missions. Okay, so now I'm just going to give you a little bit of, of information about our business planning and what we've been thinking about. We um, have been dividing our work up into three key areas to meet that mission. One is focused on business business success. Another one is employee well-being and workplace culture. And the third is member owner participation in community relationships. This is like a three-legged stool. Obviously, the business needs to be healthy. Uh, the employees are, play a key role in that. And the member owner uh, role is, is, at the end of the day, what makes the co-op unique. It's the one thing that can't be replicated by others. Um, so here's just, uh, I'm not going to have time to go through all these in detail, but we've been thinking about different things that um, we can do to improve our business. And here's a few of them. These are things that are already in process, such as um, enhancing our, our promotional programs, doing more with meat. We're having some good success with uh, rotisserie chickens, um, and we plan on expanding that for next year. An employee suggestion program, an update to the employee handbook. And so on. Again, I'm sorry I don't have time to go through this in great detail. I mentioned that um, appreciative inquiry is something that uh, um, uh, the, the staff has been focused on different ways to make the workplace um, better uh, in, a way, in ways that we care about. So communication, um, <coughs> pro professional development, big major topics. And we're also thinking about some new things for next year. Uh, we had success with the uh, reset or the changes that we made to the produce department this year, and now we're looking at making some changes to the bakery section. We have a new communications plan that we're working on. We have a, next year is a, another year for negotiating the labor contract. Um, and some additional things um, uh, that uh, we're, we're thinking about taking on as well. Um, so I'm going to... Um, Pause there and see if there are any other clarifying questions before we break into uh, table discussions. I have a question about the mission statement. When was that mission statement written and when was the last revision of it? If well, those are sort of the same thing. There was a oh, 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 wholesale change to the mission statement. And Michael and Lydia might remember this. I'm going to say 2009. <laughs> what did you say? I, I said 11. You 11? Said, so how about 10? 10? Yeah. That was my second guess. I mean, my, it was after the extension. Can I 
background to that is that what's not in there, in there is affordability and, and trying to reach the, 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 the people who need food and can't afford to come to the co-op to get it. Um, and I just wonder if that was part of, if that was considered when you were revising the last time you looked at the new statement, and if it's something that can be brought to yeah. and the next Does it, uh, Yeah, doesn't show up explicitly in the mission statement, but um, it is something that we've been talking about yeah, and it showed up in right. really coming out of the member discount question was on. Okay. You know, a top priority. Um, what can we do to, to be more accessible, more affordable, and, and part of that is outreach to others in the community. Gary? Yes. Mary. Hey, I just want the group Our to know mom. in case they don't know. That, uh, when I was on the board at MoCo, that's the new co-op in Morrisville, um, our co-op here was so, so supportive. Carrie with other staff came down <laughs> and, and actually both financially and especially professionally. Uh, it was a, a major, major contribution. I mean, if we, if we would have not been open as we, we got open if we hadn't had the support here of this co-op, so it's really wonderful. So I think it's really good to get, because if we're going to have criticisms, but it's also good to get, to be able to show some of the real positive things. The other, the other, the other question I have, and I just learned about this, um, is that I understand that a, um, a public relations person has been hired, and, uh, and I would be understandably interested as to why, what was the reason for that to happen? Yeah, so that's, that's accurate. Um, we had written in the current year business plan to establish a relationship with a firm, and, um, and which we did this year, and we selected Leonine here in town, and they helped us develop a communications plan. So I, I referred to that, and, and basically what that does, it helps us organize what are the messages that we want to communicate and what are our channels and, and how to communicate those. Um, so we worked with them in January and February, and we now have a plan. And so um, we have basically the goal is to have a steady um, uh, stream of, of um, news stories about how the co-op is meeting its mission. What do we What do we pay them to do that? That was five thousand dollars. I just want to make a couple of quick comments because some people are leaving, and we'll have some we'll have a Q and A for the council for whoever's left. I just want to just give you a little update on, on some of the things that the council was concerned about, well, we're all concerned about, but that we wanted to try to address. One of them was um, staff management relations. Um, we held a series of five roundtables, four for staff, one for um, management, and they were invited to come in for an hour and speak to, um, or to address the council. I was there, various, and Lydia was at most of them, and, and various other council members sat in, and it was anonymous. Um, feedback, and it was very, very productive, and the, um, and the comments uh, were all recorded and given to Kari uh, anonymously, and that's going to be shared with staff. Uh, we're also working on debt reduction and a few other things, but I just want to tell you that the, that the council really feels that we want to be very engaged with both the members, that's why we're having this session, um, and Kari and I have some, and we're having more, and also um, management staff relations is a, is a high priority for the, for the co-op and for the council. So what, what do we want to do, table discussions at this point? Or what, could, I, what? could I talk about you know, the, um, the communications plan with Leonine? So we just spent $5,000 to get a plan for public relations, basically. But we have people in-house in community relations, some really good people there. And I'm just curious why that can't be, uh, can't be done in-house rather than spending all that money outside. Um, Particularly at a time when senior discounts are being considered for cuts, it would seem like you know there should be better priorities about how we're spending the money. So um, it's true we do have a talented community relations team. Um, we have, as we do in other departments, have sought support where um, where our our staff feels they need that support. So specifically in the community relations, um, over the past years we've. Um, hired out help with our advertising plan, um, and there's another area. But basically, basically these are disciplines that um, we could benefit from other expertise and make sure that we're doing a good job. Um, and in terms of the investment, yes, five thousand dollars is real money, 
but this is a $25 million a year business. And I think it's important to make wise investments in maintaining things like our public image. And you, you know there have been some negative stories about the co-op, and we, we know that it's important to accept criticism, but it's also important to tell the story of the good things that the co-op is up to. I just wanted to ask about, you are talking about online shopping, and I wondered if you might have some kind of a transportation for people that are seniors and other people, not really Meals on Wheels, but you know, if you're sick or something, that you could order meals and have them delivered. Yeah, so that, that's exactly the kind of feedback that we're, we're looking we're here. for. This for is the, why we want the suggestions and have this conversation. And, I, and I, I had mentioned once before that I thought when you bring senior bags to the senior center to give to poor people, that it should be for that and not for people who are more affluent, that there should be some kind of a, uh, a financial thing put on whether you can get a bag, whether you're getting Medicaid or you're getting something. <laughs> And it's not just for every senior who happens to walk through the senior center. What was that? What percentage of the members actually participate? There's fourteen percent of members. So. So. Yeah. So considering how low that number really is, uh, how much weight decision-wise? Could in good faith be placed into the results of it? Well, I, so I don't think I don't consider that to be that low. I mean, you can do sampling with smaller rates of that and have it be representative. Um, but at the end of the day, it's just it's just a survey. There, I mean, there's nothing that's being um, there's no deci final decisions that are being made based on that survey alone. Okay, so uh, what I, well, it's 7.15, and we said that we would break at 7.15. So if it makes sense, what I would suggest is let's take our five-minute break. Folks that are ready to go, great, thanks for being here. If you want to stick around, then we'll kind of get a sense. Do we want to do the table exercise with those who are interested, or do we want to or, or do it? Or, yeah, or, or we can have the, you know, the council open session. Um, and then we have those forms, so if people want to write or email me or whatever, we'd love to get your input. Jean. I don't know if this was intended to be part of your program, but there's this multiple page document. I wonder if somebody can distill it down into sure. a summary. So yeah, there were um, copies of the, it's the summary report from the third round of uh, member engagement on the um, call conversation series regarding member discounts. And so, um, is, you know, over the past year and a half, we've been talking with members and staff about member discounts, uh, which have been growing rapidly over recent years. And so we've been sharing that information and getting feedback about what do you think should be done. And basically that report uh, summarizes the last round in which we, um, the committee that we have, um, uh, brought forth some draft recommendations, and we got feedback on that, and now that has been given to our committee, and the committee is in the process of finalizing the recommendations that it's going to make to the management team. So there's some good information in that, um, but it, it sort of points the direction that we, we think we're heading. Uh, I watched an interview uh, on national TV. Um, uh, an owner of about a $5 billion company was being interviewed. And the, the, the interviewer asked him at, at the end of the interview one, one special, special question. The question was, with all of your years of experience, the money, the success, the failures, what, is you, what do you feel the highest priority should be, is, or should be for your business or any small or larger business? What is the one highest priority? And it was just very interesting to hear that. And, uh, and he said, Having the employees feel that they have a conscious and honest connection with the organization, and if they have problems, they they, they trust that someone will be there genuinely <coughs> listening to them. And I just thought that would be interesting. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So why don't we break, and then if you would like to stick around, we will.
Continue. <laughs> Five minutes. And thank you. For <laughs> If you haven't signed in, please do. We get a good headcount. So thank you for staying. Um, we have two things that we can do. One is we could um, work in small groups to discuss these questions and then report out. And or we could do the open session and talk about whatever people want to talk about. So who's in favor of the first? Which was the small table. Small table discussions about these questions. So that just fill them in and we're going to open it up. My name is Paul Olson and I have been a member of the co-op for 45 years and I just want to say that one thing that was not said earlier is just how fortunate we are to have this organization in this town and to have it be led by people like this. I just think you guys are doing a wonderful job. Which does not imply that there are not lots of challenges which we've heard, but I think we're very, very well served, and I very much appreciate what you do. Well, this is maybe an off the wall kind of suggestion. Um, we heard that MM is closing, and there is that means there's going to be no redemption center. Is, is this something that the co op could pick up? Have you looked at the, the costs of it? And uh, but I mean, it, that's, it, that, that's a vision. That, that's well, excellent. okay, because it would, in fact, start to bring new customers to the co-op. Yeah. Well, yeah, there's things, that, things that you don't want to sell, but nonetheless, things that you do want to sell, and and it might and it would be a community service because there is no other place to redeem bottles and cans. Um, I know that there are going to be costs. The question is, are there benefits that at least equally that exceeded and it would contribute in some sense to the community out there? Honestly, we haven't looked at that particular model. We've, we've talked about having a small satellite location. Didn't necessarily uh, consider that, but obviously that's some, a need that Montpelier is going to have very shortly. Uh, Peter Kalman, um, I've been a member of the co-op for three different periods of my life, starting when there was no building, and it was just a group buying uh, out in the, I think it was out in Plainfield, I can't even remember now, it was so long ago, but anyway, um, I'm, I'm back. <laughs> and um, I actually think it's a good idea to invest $5,000 for a communication plan. I think it's a good idea to hire professionals who really know how to do something, and one of the things I'd like to see you consider is to get a statistician in to do some more sophisticated statistical analysis than you get from these, uh, uh, these surveys. And in particular, just for example, um, of the 9,000 
members, it would be great if we could get a per household, which is tricky in itself, because you just identify people by individuals, but per household buying. And what is the distribution curve, both in terms of what's the average, the mean, but also what's the median? You know, how many people are you know buying very little? How many people are buying a lot? Um, and the, this kind of analysis can, can teach you something about when, when you make decisions about discount programs or any kind of decision where you think you know who your customer is. You will know better who your customer is with a more sophisticated statistical analysis, which will cost you some money. And I just also like to comment on, I was a treasurer for numerous years before this year. And this is the, uh, Tim Wingate is our, our CFO, and, and Kari is the general manager. This is a very, very conservative, a fiscally conservative organization um, between their budgets and every dollar that they spend. And it, it is not a spendthrift organization that says we'll spend five thousand on this and ten thousand dollars on that. Quite the opposite. I think it's very, very, very conservative. Oh, I just wanted to ask about the membership. We have nine thousand members now. What does that mean? Nine thousand paying members that continue to pay, or nine thousand people that have been members that are. Nine nine thousand members that are in good standing. Oh, okay. That are current members. We about seventy percent of our the business is from um, from members. The other thirty percent uh, constitutes people that are not uh, members of the co-op. Yeah, exactly right. So uh, we know that about half of them have made their full equity investment, and the other half are in the process of a payment plan. And um, we also know that uh, roughly 98% of them shopped in the last year. So there's a couple percent out there that haven't been at the call but remain members. Well, I, was, I was just wondering if people like, oh, well, I haven't paid for years because I haven't paid up. You're fully, fully invested, yeah. Pay, and we don't have to yeah. up to 60, we, and we do rely on people, if they move or if they pass away, pass on, and you folks have to uh, request their but a lot of people back. move on and not request their right. back. Yeah, that, that does happen. So, are those people still being counted as uh, Yes, they would be. Members? They would be, but we know it's about somewhere around 2% that didn't shop last year. Okay. We're not going to let, let those people vote for Trump. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm a facetious individual. The, um, because we're in such a good financial position, we just had a finance committee meeting the other day, and. Um, and we we're, we're going to um, have a proposal to the uh, council to retire, I think it's 130, potentially $130,000 of our debt, either prepaying, partially prepaying our mortgage. Um, and we also have, I think, a 4.5% um, loan that's still outstanding for, for five years. So we're, we're continually trying to manage uh, where we can save money and what, what's, the, what's the, uh, the most benefit use of our capital. Harry, you, you apologize for not, not knowing what the figures mean because there are only 14% of the members represented in the, in the shopper survey. Well, there are ways of getting those kind of members to be representative of the membership population. And it's going to cost a lot of money, but they can, it can be done. <laughs> I just wanted to offer an appreciation for the co-op's commitment to local producers and going forward, I think that you know supporting farm viability and supporting local purchasing, especially with these broader trends with Amazon Whole Foods that we can't control, I think would be a real priority and us to focus on. Among the concerns I remember in the presentations was the projected growth of the online uh, food retailers like Amazon Pantry, I imagine, and uh, Google is venturing into that as well. Uh, what are the thoughts that uh, are being discussed uh, to address this? Because it, it's, it's pretty scary. Yeah. 
Yeah, so I, I don't think I referred to it in the presentation, but there was a bullet saying online grocery sales represent 2% of the industry and could be as high as 20% by 2025. Um, so in terms of what we're doing currently, we did an analysis a few years back on delivery. It wasn't necessarily an online um, study um, of online grocery, but um, uh, that, what that told us was we could probably run a delivery service but we wouldn't be doing it for any, um, as a profit center. It would be an investment. It would be a service to the community, as, and, and it would be limited to, you know, Montpelier and, and you know the near environs. In terms of, of just think of, I'm just talking about staying competitive. I'm not yeah. just comparing to trying to deliver. Right. So um, we've identified doing basically another study about online and what are our options. We've also asked NCG to, to also you know, do a white paper and, and provide us with an overview of what should we be considering. I don't think it makes a lot of sense for independent standalone stores to reinvent the wheel um, and try to go head to head with somebody like Amazon. It's just, um, it, it, it may be that we, we feel we need to, so sorry. Um, it may be that that we want to do something like the you know have a online ordering with pickup option as a as a service you know to play sort of defense, but I don't think it's ever going to be a strength of ours. Um, and and I, I have the sense that strategically we should really focus on the things that we can um, excel at and that and, and differentiate us from from the mass market. That's my sense. I, I think Billy was next. Um, one of the questions on the slide on the sheet of paper is what else should the co-op do to improve uh, and advance our blank? And this gentleman over here mentioned uh, the mission statement earlier. And I'm wondering, in conjunction with the council's work on putting forward a vision statement in the coming year, if we could include in that um, some kind of a review or a rehab of what the mission statement is. Because when I look at it, I just don't see it. It's, it's, that, that it could be more complete than it already is. So that's just a suggestion for the council. Kind of on the along the lines of um, doing delivery, have you given any thought to maybe teaming up with the likes of Adam at Co-op and where people could do their ordering um, and then that could be dropped at a certain time of the week or certain days of the week, you could do that. Kind of like the, the library bookmobile. Yeah. Because um, I, I see people drive them to cows and so forth. I see people drive to Montpelier to go to co-op and then sure. drive back and it makes no sense and it seems like yeah. it, and it might help in a uh, big rate at event as well exactly. um, yeah we have had some discussions of that in the past and it's interesting we could actually if 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 hunger mountain were ordering the product and having it delivered to our store you, united natural foods doesn't care where it ends up so we could actually Adamant or Buffalo Mountain or Plainfield could actually have the same pricing as us, which would be a major benefit if you talk to the yeah. staff of those. That, that would be a major boon. But the logistics are not simple. You know, that we have, I don't know if you've been in our back room, but there's no room. There's no, there's no room for anything. So product can only move through immediately. That's the, the only way it, things flow. And so we've never been able to work out the logistics other than we have experimented with it at truckload sales. So when we have that big tent and we are able to store products outside, we say, hey, why don't, why don't the co-ops uh, participate in this and we'll sell products at our cost and then you can pass along that savings to your members. And we've had some success with that, but it, I think it's fallen off in recent times. How are prices set? Are they a percentage? Is it the same percentage for everything over what you buy, or is it, how do you determine yeah. how you're gonna set the prices? Yeah. That's a really good question. We could spend an hour on that. <laughs> um, it's not the same. It varies by um, department and, and within departments categories. And within categories, there's even some lines, and then we typically will favor things like local products or, or um, you know, things that we wanna support. Um, but essentially the market sets it. And we have a sense of if, if it's a 
similar or identical product worth selling for down the street. We know we have to be comparable. We can't be ridiculous. We can't look look terrible, um, uh, or else it just won't sell. Um, and uh, and then the other thing I would say is that that is part of the planning, it's part of the budgeting, and we're saying. Listen, produce, we need X from you next year. And they say, well, we think we can only do Y. And then we say, well, what are we going to do about that? Because it all needs to fit together. And what we haven't talked about is while the co op is on you know, sound financial footing, we walk an incredibly tight um, um, you know, margin. You know, our, our net income is 1% or less. And we typically give half of that back as a patronage refund. So there's very little room for error. But um, you know, we benefit from this incredible stability in our community and support. And I, I can pretty much gauge what next week's sales are going to be based on the same week last year, you know, within within a you know plus or minus of a percent or so. And it's and it's just amazing the the support and dedication that that uh, folks in this community have for natural foods. With my low income, I'm not one of your biggest <laughs> customers, but I did try to come in with a sale on some cheese, and I thought, oh my, I can get some Cabot cheese at a really good price. And uh, I came in, and um, I had to get buy two things of the Cabot cheese to be over $20, and it was, it was about the same price as the regular price at Shaw's or Price Chopper, with your discount. So I just say, do you do they not give you? Do they make you pay more for your Cabot cheese than they do at Price Chopper or Rojas? Is that a competitive thing that they're doing for? You know, they're a co-op, right? Supposedly. Yeah. And um, I, I had another thing I wanted to mention too. I grew up during World War II, and during World War II, we had out in Waitsfield in the Valley, we had a truck that came from the local store delivering groceries all over the, there. You could do some truckload sales with you when you have your bulk things. You could take it to Adamant or to, you know, to East Montpelier or Plainfield or somewhere, and uh, maybe spread out that way. And it might be a good way to get some bargains and also help you, help us. Yeah. Okay. So thanks for the suggestion and then the question about pricing of Cabot. That that is an interesting one. There are certain products that are relatively local um, where we struggle to get the same pricing as some of our regional chains like Shaw's or Price Chopper. Cabot definitely comes to mind. Ben & Jerry's in that category where um, Ben & Jerry's has basically negotiated a contract with a chain of 100 plus stores. Of course the pricing is gonna be better and we don't sell Ben & Jerry's anymore. But um, with Cabot, we raise that concern with them. It's like, we're a co-op, you're a co-op. This is cheddar cheese. This is what the community wants. And so, you know, what they offered us was, I thought, a, a pretty good deal. I, the, in terms of the eight ounce blocks, I, I believe we are competitive, especially if you shop on Mondays. Oh, I get the three pound. Oh. <laughs> you, take a look at the eight ounce blocks on Mondays. It's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a very good deal. They're much, well, they're much more expensive than to get it in the bulk and the larger size. <laughs> Nancy, then Stephen. I, I'm Nancy. I just wanted to say that um, the redesign of the produce department is absolutely splendid. Um, it's so attractive. You can't walk through without buying too much, or more than you <laughs> intended. And, and I also wanted to say that um, the samples that are served in the co-op are generous and wonderful, and they are great contributor to sales because you taste this and you think, I need this. <laughs> Perhaps I should know the answer to this question. But anyway, the prevailing narrative in, um, in what we've been hearing for the last, I guess, 18 months or so regarding the new competitive landscape is that um, the natural food sector has become lucrative and attractive and popular enough so the big stores are getting into the business, hence the competition and hence the slowing of our growth. And um, 
I'd like to know if there's some kind of a mirror thing going on, if you know, if there's some kind of a mirror thing going on in the commercial sector. Are some of the big stores um, maybe reaching into this organic market because they're running out of places to expand and maybe there's a similar carnage going on there with their growth going down. Um, I'm just curious if we're if we're all in the same boat, or if we're just kind of kind of a sitting duck for these big monsters that are coming in to get the best of us. Yeah, I'm not an expert in the conventional food industry, but uh, you know a little bit. And um, one of the things I'd say is that for years, conventional grocery was essentially stagnant. There wasn't much growth there. And we were all surprised at how long it took the Shaws and the Price Choppers in the world to notice Walmart, to notice the, the growth that was happening in natural and organic. And, and for a while, you, they were sort of dabbling. And what we've seen over the past 10 years is they've gotten in whole hog. And I have a slide that I didn't bring, but um, two years ago it shifted, and now more natural and organic foods are sold by conventional retailers than by the natural the natural segment. And I don't expect that change, so that, that, that trend to change any, anytime soon. Um, as far as how they're doing, I think it's a, totally a mixed bag. I think that there are some chains that are, are um, doing very well and expanding rapidly, especially in urban markets. And there are others that um, are filing for bankruptcy. We're seeing it fairly regularly. I think there is, there's a type of competitor out there that's caught in the middle, that they're not the big box, lowest price um, leader, and they're not able to, to compete with Amazon, uh, Walmart, and Kroger, um, effectively in a way. And they're not necessarily on our end of the spectrum where they can, you know, a store where you can offer an authentic experience with real food and real people, and that's such a great service. And I think that I, I think that the future is probably not great for those in the, in the middle. But we'll see how it plays out. Whenever you talk about growth, you should really make clear to people that rate of growth and growth are two different things, and that, for example. We continue to grow every year, but the rate at which we grow is declining. This is very common when a business hits a certain size. It's much harder to grow by a greater percent when you are already at, at a higher size. And, and, and I think that, so that is, that's an important distinction, but that's not what I'm gonna talk about. So it's also, it's also relevant. It's also relative to your population that's not growing. Washington County is not growing. Chittenden is. So Grand Vermont is not. Right. So, so that, again, that's a part of the more sophisticated statistical analysis. But what I really would like to just say something about, and it's related to the senior discount um, brouhaha of the last couple of years. I think that we as a co-op, we as a community, Montpelier, need to recognize that we have three kind of distinct populations. And we do very well with two of them, and not so well in the middle. The wealthier of us do very well here, whether we're seniors or not. The poor get a lot of attention by a lot of things in the state. People in the middle are getting shafted. I really believe that when we talk about discounts, some of us who don't need the discounts need an affirmative way to say, take my discount and give it to people who are at the lower end of the middle. I'm a senior, I'm 75 years old, but I don't need the discount. And it's not enough for me to just say, oh, okay, I won't collect it. Let's figure out a way to affirmatively contribute it. There's plenty of wealthy people in this town who could give their discounts to the people who are on that bottom edge. I've said this to you before. I need to work. Group. As long as they get a tax break for it. 
So I, I don't even care about a tax break. <laughs> Just talk about market has made me wonder about CSAs and how they affect the co-op. It seems like they could be a competitor, but maybe not necessarily. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Uh, I don't have much data to refer to, but obviously we've seen uh, a large growth in the, um, the direct sales from farms, including CSAs. And you know, essentially, we just don't view that as competition. We view that as success. Um, and so at different times in our history, we've published lists of where you can purchase direct. Um, uh, uh, but we, you know, our role is to, is to be the marketplace every day for those local products where um, not, not all farmers want to want CSAs. They certainly can't do it every day. So, um, but, but, but generally, yeah, we're, we're, you know, we are supportive of the state's farm to plate plan. And you know, we want to grow the whole system. So I think Billy's going to Regarding the CSAs and the, our local farmers, I think that's an opportunity area for us. We already, you know, of our sales, 40% of them come from local growers, and local producers, and manufacturers. And um, to give you just a point of reference, there's a, a local farm here that's a CSA in Montpelier, who was actually at the market last year, so we wound up the market. But, you know, when they moved the market, the few days that they moved the market from the parking area to State Street, their sales doubled, uh, which tells me that, you know, there's there's obviously interest in our local farms and supporting our local farmers, and maybe there's a way for us uh, to increase uh, that interaction and that relationship with our local farms. So it's an opportunity, and it's wonderful that they're doing great and they're growing like, you know, like you mentioned. Um, I just want to be mindful of time because, um, Supposed to leave at eight. Yeah, just a quick question. Um, <clears throat> earlier, it was the co-op's investment policy was mentioned, and I'm just wondering what that is. And um, are we sort of traditionally invested in a traditional portfolio, the more socially responsible portfolio? And specifically, I'm, I'm curious about climate change and investments in fossil fuel industry. So the investments that we have are really in in cooperatives and the co-op fund in New England. Um, the rest, of, and the yeah, policy is actually, it, if you look at it, it's actually our excess cash policy. It's, 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 how are we going to spread out the co-op? Co has about two million in cash, and it's basically spread out amongst local banks at the FDIC limit or below. Um, and we're not screening, you know, for their business practices and how um, environmentally, you know, um, conscious they are. Um, there are local banks, and, um, and the, the goal there really is to keep a certain amount of liquidity and protect it with the FDIC limit of two hundred fifty thousand. Um, we do have a uh, employee four hundred one k program that we manage, and by popular demand, we have added over time various options so that if someone wants a socially screened fund or specifically, um, it's got to help me out. So, so, but but it's uh, carbon free. So, um, and we, so we have a number of options, and uh, you know, the challenge there is, as fiduciaries, are we offering um, options that provide a reasonable rate of return, but also meet the values? Something we think about. Okay. So when we first moved here 30 years ago, John, there were almost re almost a worker requirement, and I know in some yeah. cases in some co-ops where we had been before, we did have to work. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that there is a worker discount, and Nancy participated for the for the truckload sale. But I'm wondering if there, you know, it's not clear what opportunities there are for workers, and maybe it would be it would might shift some of this this group of discount people if there were more if there were more opportunities and if they were better advertised so that people know that that's an opportunity as opposed to the senior for example. It's a great topic and uh, it is, if you look over the 40 year um, history of the call, 45 years now, that's one of the biggest shifts is going
going from member operated to employee operated. And, and so when it comes to the actual work in the store, we are now a, a union shop. I mean, that, that, that's what we are. We've carved out a certain amount of hours for members to do bagging and um, um, cup cheese and things like that. But it's, it's, it's going to be limited in the, in the near future. We do have some other options like truckload sale, events, supporting events, those kinds of things. We call that a support worker. Um, if, if we're not doing enough to advertise that, we will try harder. I will say that we have struggled mightily in, in recent years to fill some some of those openings, like the truckload sale. I don't know if you've experienced that, but we're, 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 we're it's sure. fun. And it is fun. Yeah. Got a discount for three months. Yeah. <laughs> for actively looking for truckload volunteers now, there's a sign up in in the yeah. exit way. So and then the, if you're interested, it's for every two hours you work, you receive a six six percent discount for two weeks. So it's a good deal. Yeah. Um, there's a third category that we've been trying to develop over time, which is called outreach workers. So members working on our behalf out in the community um, in exchange for a discount. We've hit a snag with liability. Um, because if someone's receiving compensation, they're in a sense an employee and we're responsible for anything that might happen to them on the job or to and from that job. So we need to, we need to work that out before we can really more fully developed that program. But we've been allocating hours to things like um, gleaning and working in the schools. And it's a, it's, there's a lot of opportunity here. It just needs more publicity. Yes. Can we give Paul the last word? That sounds wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> we, we all want to be better tomorrow or next year. And most businesses want to grow. They want to make more money. They want to see the bottom line. Bigger, etc. And for all the years that I've watched this co op and been part of it, the membership has grown, the volume has grown, it's, it's been very exciting. One of the things I would like to charge the council and the management to look at is a slightly different model of business success where we could be just thrilled to be at 9,000, 10,000, 12,000 members. We, and understand that it won't, we won't get any bigger than that, and figure out maybe there are other things that we could really look at, like loyalty or other things to measure our success than continually hoping to grow, because I think at some point we won't. And if we don't change how we look at it, then all of a sudden, Kari or somebody will be up here announcing failing. that we're failing. And I don't think we are if we level off. I think level off can be just wonderful. So I wanted to say that. And thank you very much for the last word. I wish my wife would let me do that. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll let you be the last, absolute last one. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> is, it, is, it, is it us, Shadow? Okay. Um, Kari, I, I have always had um, both, even though I come a psychologist, non-traditional, and coming from a, a somewhat less perspective, I've had both the positive and negative view of unions um, over the years, the large unions, small unions, and I know that there's been some challenge here at our co-op with the unions, and, and could you give us an idea now as to whether there's any balance coming or whether there's more open communication? Uh, that is, what, 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 well, how do you feel about the present status of the unions as a co op? Well, I thank you all for <laughs> <laughs> actually, actually, but from the council's perspective, I, I know it's been a, it's been a, a major effort, um, and he's been keeping us surprised in one of his, um, in both of his uh, GM evaluation, and I'll, I'll, I'm not supposed to really talk about it, but one of, one of his, one of his points has been he's, he's very, very concerned and really wants to work toward better union um, negotiations or, or union relations. Relations, thank you. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know even where to start. It's, it's one of our biggest challenges as a co-op is, is making sure that to the best we can, that the union and the management are on the same page and, and cooperating. I, I think we have way more shared interests than we have um, separate interests. Um, somehow the differences get magnified and, and um, emphasized um, and I'd like to see less of that I'd like to see more cooperation because I do think 
you know, you think that the purpose of the union is to protect the employee's specific interests. That is exactly the co-op's interest as well. Yes, there are places where we will, we will um, not agree, but I think that there's, there's all the opportunity in the world to work together towards to our mutual benefit. And I, I, you know, it's a personal challenge. It's a collective challenge. And we're just going to keep trying. And I think it's right at the top of the list of priorities. And so things like um, housekeeping meetings, which is where the um, union leaders and uh, senior managers get together and work proactively uh, on, on, on whatever the issues are of the day. Not grievances, not contract negotiations, but just people, you know, cooperating. It's 759. <laughs> Thank you for coming. If you haven't signed in, please sign in. Hand in your, um, your vision statement sheets, whatever your suggestions are. Thank you very much. The council is always interested to hear what you have to say. Come to a council meeting, run for election, and give us your feedback.